Seek truth. Hear truth. Learn truth. Love truth. Adhere to truth. Defend truth unto death. The truth can also prove uncomfortable when it asks us to abandon long-held prejudices and stereotypes. This is as true of churches, ecclesial communities, and religions, as it is of nations and individuals. Yet the truth which sets us free from error is also the truth which sets us free for love. With these words, Pope John Paul II brought to a close the intense scholarly investigation he had ordered eight years before. It had been almost six centuries since the most powerful leaders in the Western world had condemned and executed Jan Hus, a priest from a humble peasant family. To the end, Hus maintained that his only crime was seeking the truth. Historians, theologians, Catholic and Protestant leaders, and other interested parties had re-examined every aspect of the case, the role of the church, the times, and of Hus himself. For Hus, it was too late, but the Pope wanted to know if the church had wrongly condemned an innocent man. To the Czechs, he's a national hero. Uh, to others, he's a heretic who disrupted religious life, who precipitated this Hussite revolution, which some would say absolutely destroyed aspects of Czech society. The Protestants have tried to claim him as a proto-Protestant. He's been held up as a nationalistic figure. Uh, the communists took him as their champion and uh, lauded his efforts. He's become an ecumenical church person. Some would see him as a saint, others as a martyr, others as just a political figure, and on the negative side, a deluded man who died for no good reason other than that he was stubborn and couldn't listen to sound advice and opinion. As scholars poured over documents, records, and eyewitness accounts, it became apparent that in the search for the truth, there would be no simple answer. If there was a center of European thought and culture in 1370, it was a long way from Goose Town, a tiny village in southern Bohemia. Husenets, as it was known in the local language, was home to geese, cattle, and chicken, as well as a handful of people. The main occupation was farming, but the soil and the people were poor. There was a church in the town, but no resident priest. But it was here that Jan Hus was born. He spent his early years in this house, or in one very much like it. The boy showed intellectual promise and a great deal of ambition. But in this tiny village there were few books and fewer opportunities. For a peasant in a medieval society, there was little future possible save a life of subsistence farming, hard work, and early death. When I was a young student, I'll admit to having an evil desire. For I sought to become a priest quickly in order to secure a good livelihood, to dress well, and to have people look up to me. After several years of study in the nearby city of Prakatice, young Jan Hus was one of a handful of students accepted into the university in Prague. As a university student, Hus was able to earn a meager living copying books for libraries and wealthy patrons. Among the works he encountered were the writings of John Wycliffe, 
an English philosopher and professor who challenged many of the attitudes and behaviors of the Catholic Church. Now, there are two things that pertain to the status of a pastor, the holiness of the pastor and the wholesomeness of his teaching. He ought to be holy, so strong in every sort of virtue that he would rather desert every kind of human intercourse, all the temporal things of the world, even mortal life itself, before he would sinfully depart from the truth of Christ. We do know what Hus thought about Wycliffe. We have the advantage of several manuscripts that are extant in archives, and in the margins, the handwriting of Jan Hus. One of them, he says, I wish I could be where Wycliffe's soul is. Wycliffe, of course, was long deceased. On another occasion, in another manuscript, Hoos writes, Wow, Wycliffe, you're going to turn a lot of heads. So he had admiration, and he was also convinced that at least on certain points, Wycliffe was right. After graduation, Jan Hus was ordained as a priest, although the employment prospects were not good. At this time, Prague had 44 churches, 27 chapels, and more than 1,200 priests. Hus supported himself by teaching at the university. Hus was also successful as a university teacher, winning merit, for promoting the spiritual education of the common people. In this respect, the Czech lands were quite far behind Western and Southern Europe. Therefore, the internal Christianization, making faith accessible to people so that they would embrace it as something more than merely going to a confession once a year, was a very slow process in our lands. Years later, while living in exile, Hus spent much time writing and clarifying the principles he had taught at the university. One of the most important of these works was a book titled simply, on the church, which sought to clarify the role of the church in the people's daily lives. Hus believed that the church was indeed without error, but this referred to the church triumphant, the spiritual body of Christ, not the church militant as headed by a pope and bishops. By extension, not everyone in the Catholic Church was a member of the true church, but many outside it were. Likewise, the Pope was not the actual head of the Church, just of a particular group of followers, and if the Pope was living in sin, he was not a true representative of God. It was the dawn of the 15th century and nearly every aspect of European society was in turmoil. The Black Death had recently ravaged the continent, killing as much as a third of the population. Peasants and serfs were beginning to demand a better life for themselves and their families. The organized church was seen by many as corrupt, distant, and out of touch with the needs of the public. The poet Francesco Petrarch wrote of his visit to the papal court here reign the successors of the poor fishermen of Galilee. They have strangely forgotten their origin. I am astounded as I recall their predecessors to see these men, loaded with gold and clad in purple, boasting of the spoils of princes and nations, to see luxurious palaces and heights crowned with fortifications instead of a boat turned downward for shelter. There was a lot of anti-clericalism that is to say, a lot of criticism of the clergy for being ignorant, for being uh, uh, immoral, for being slovenly, for so on and so forth. And uh, these were not criticisms that were whispered in corridors, but that were thundered from pulpits. So priests saying how bad the priests were and how they needed to shape up and uh, or ship out. Uh, so that is an important feature of medieval life. It's kind of almost a... a Sometimes I describe it as sort of a hysteria at the end of the Middle Ages. While there were numerous conscientious priests and bishops, many aspects of the church called out for reform. Priests allegedly extorted money from parishioners in return for performing basic religious services. Monks were seen by many as corrupt and immoral. 
In a forbidden practice known as simony, bishops and archbishops were often appointed not for their skills, but in return for large cash payments. And it's named for a guy named Simon Magus, who attempted to buy spiritual power from the apostles. In the medieval context, simony was the buying of ecclesiastical power or ecclesiastical office. The archbishopric in Prague, which came vacant in the early 15th century, was subjected to a number of bidders. Perhaps most disturbing was the question of who exactly was the Pope. While Hus was still a child, a series of disputes led to the election of two rival popes. One ruled from Rome and the other from Avignon in what is now southern France. Papal loyalties tended to break along regional lines with various monarchs negotiating with either papacy for the best deal. Mass in those days was, of course, in Latin. Uh, and uh, there was some discussion about the language, whether it should be in Latin or should be in the vernacular. One problem, of course, was that the... Uh, uh, Few people uh, outside of those who had gone to the university uh, could follow uh, what was going on. That is, they could, fo could not follow the text of what was being said. So there was a kind of a distance, a psychological distance between what was going on and what people were doing during Mass. The Bethlehem Chapel was founded in 1391 by two Czech businessmen. It was a non parochial church, that is to say, it was somewhat independent. And the striking feature of the Bethlehem Chapel is that it was founded specifically for preaching in the vernacular. Hus was named rector of the Bethlehem Chapel. Here he preached in the Czech language several times a week while he continued to teach and study at the university. The chapel welcomed merchants, nobility, common peasants, and even the Queen of Bohemia. Although Hus studied and taught almost entirely in Prague, some of his friends traveled abroad. A few of these friends returned from England, carrying some later works of John Wycliffe. These were not mere re-evaluations of dogma and ceremony. They were radical changes to almost every aspect of the church structure and theology. Wycliffe suggested that the pope and bishops had no special authority, that the common people could interpret scripture for themselves, and that the central Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation was what he termed blasphemous folly. When a lion devours a man, it does not also devour his soul. Yet his soul is present in every part of his body. Thus should one believe concerning the body of Christ in the sacrament of the altar. Entirely too many laymen, as well as clergy, are so unfaithful in this matter that they believe, worse than the pagans, that the consecrated host is their god. People often talk about the miracle of transubstantiation, that is to say the conversion of this bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That's not, a, that's not an accurate way of speaking about it. This is not really a miracle. This is a Christian mystery uh, uh, that we believe with the eyes of faith, but uh, it's not, uh, technically speaking, a miracle. Wycliffe was tried as a heretic, though a verdict was never reached. Ultimately, he was exiled to a small English town until he died quietly of natural causes. There were other reformers as well, along with a number of splinter groups and sects. The church sought to reform itself first by unifying itself under a single pope. A special council was convened in Pisa, Italy, and a simple solution was proposed. The two existing popes would be deposed, and a new pope would take over the entire church. The council selected Alexander V, a highly respected clergyman, but both existing pontiffs considered themselves the highest authority in the church and refused to step down. The situation was not settled and that now, uh, instead of two people contending to be Pope, there were three people contending to be Pope. After some political negotiations, church leaders in Prague switched their loyalty from Gregory, 
the Pope ruling in Rome, to Alexander, who established his court in Bologna. Pope Alexander died after only a few months in office. And in a kind of a hasty uh, move, a priest who was not really uh, very well qualified uh, by the name of Balthazar Cosa was elected to succeed him, and he took the name of John the Twenty Third. Uh, so his he was had a military career basically. He was probably unfit for what he was called to do. He'd been a pirate for heaven's sake. This was a man with more experience in the secular world than in the spiritual world. The Council of Pisa failed to end the Great Schism. Many reformers called for another church council, this one with an authority higher than the Pope's. Pope John XXIII chose a different path towards church unity. He raised an army and attacked Rome and the supporters of Pope Gregory. To finance the war, he offered the sale of indulgences throughout the lands loyal to him. It was uh, based on the idea that, um, yeah, we're good people, we die, but we're not quite ready for the vision of God, and we need to be purified. So there's a state of purgation, a purgatory state somewhere between heaven and hell. I mean, you're on your way to heaven, but you're not quite there. Uh, so maybe you can do something in this life to help you purify you, to help you lessen the time you'll be spending in purgatory. So you do some good deed. Uh, you do some penance for your sin, although your sin may be forgiven, you do some penance. Or another good deed, a dangerous one, is to give money to some good cause. And that's where the problem comes in in the late Middle Ages. To all truly penitent and confessed who would take up the cross either at their own expense or who would equip and support a soldier for a month, is promised remission of such of their sins of which they were heartily contrite and had confessed. The selling of indulgences became a very lucrative trade. Large coffers were set up near the entrances of the bigger churches. Almost without exception, political and religious leaders endorsed the practice and the sales commissions they generated. Protože prodávat odpustky bylo pro for Hus and his group, selling indulgences was something utterly immoral, something in conflict with the message of the Bible and the true faith. Hus had no choice but to oppose the selling of indulgences. A purely business arrangement, the sale of indulgences was connected with large commissions. As before, when he felt there were problems within the church, Hus spoke out against the sale of indulgences. In doing so, he opposed his church, his king, and ultimately his own survival. The region today, known as the Czech Republic, has changed hands many times since the Romans gave it the name Bohemia. In the time of Hus, it was an independent kingdom within the weak confederation of the Holy Roman Empire, or First Reich. But while the bulk of the people in Bohemia were Czech, much of the aristocracy and church leadership was German. Bethlehem Chapel, the only church to offer preaching in the Czech language, soon became not only a center of religious instruction, but also a base for the Czech peasantry who felt suppressed by the mostly German aristocracy. People came to the Bethlehem Chapel because they were attracted to the fact that preaching was in the vernacular, not in the Latin, and because Hus addressed contemporary issues that related to their lives in his sermons. After Hus and others had standardized the Czech language, it became increasingly popular not only for day-to-day -day life, but also for scholarly discussions and instruction. 
This was particularly true at the university, where the students and faculty broke into separate factions. When the king ordered the university administration reorganized to reflect the population, German professors left en masse. The new Czech majority elected their most prominent instructor as university rector. Thus, whether he wanted it or not, Hus was now the most visible leader of the resistance to German domination. The reform circle to which Hus belonged harbored the opinion that the Czech nation had been called to put the church in order again. But with this thinking, there was also a threat to the power of the establishment. In the years following Hus's death, relations between Germans and Czechs dissolved into violent civil war. Tensions between Czechs and Germans did not end in the Middle Ages, and whenever outsiders have attacked Bohemia, Hus has been an emblem of resistance and independence. I don't think we have any evidence where Hus incited violence or revolutionary action in that sense, but he did motivate people to take their faith seriously and apply that in the social context. Church officials pronounced Wycliffe a heretic. Friends of Hus who preached the forbidden doctrines were imprisoned. The archbishop gathered all the copies of Wycliffe's writings and burned them within his palace walls. It is not heresy simply to read books. Until then, Hus had had no real enemies that could have presented a threat for him. However, the archbishop denied Hus protection when Hus refused to obey him. Hus, his students and a group of university masters, Hus's supporters, had refused to surrender Wycliffe's works. In response to request from the archbishop of Prague, the Pope issued a bull banning all preaching in private chapels such as Bethlehem. The bull shows that the Pope opposed God's laws by ordering that the free preaching of the Word of God be stopped, contrary to the word and deeds of our Savior Jesus Christ. When preaching was ordered stopped in the Bethlehem chapel, Hus went into the pulpit he read the bull of condemnation and he said, I'm not going to agree with this. Will you stand with me? And we are told that the couple of thousand people that were there shouted in one accord, we do stand with you and we will. And preaching did not stop. Pope John XXIII ordered the Bethlehem Chapel demolished. A large group of mostly Germans faithful to the Pope surrounded the Bethlehem Chapel. They brought simple tools and began to tear at the walls and pull the building down. It was a bold plan with very bad timing. The doors of the church opened and parishioners who had been attending a service burst out and drove off the angry mob. Hus disagreed with church leaders on a number of issues but his defiance became most pronounced regarding the sale of indulgences. The whole affair caused much outrage in Prague and claimed its first victims, three young Hus supporters. City leaders arrested three students and charged them with organizing the demonstration. As town councillors looked out at the angry crowd, they debated the fate of the students. The crowd rallied and grew. Finally, council members agreed to be lenient with the young men, and the crowd dispersed. A short time later, the students were beheaded. We know of pious women who retrieved the bodies, wrapped them in linen, took them to the Bethlehem Chapel, and people were outraged. Hus performed a special ceremony designating the students as martyrs, they were buried behind a stone inside the Bethlehem Chapel. What started as a disagreement over religious interpretation now threatened to explode into a full revolution. Even though his wife was a follower of Hus, the king saw the need for immediate action. <laughs> 
King Václav could not let such disturbances go unnoticed. This was the culmination of the conflict between the king and Hus's group. Jan Hus was a popular leader whose sincerity was never questioned, but he continued to preach when ordered not to and treated as heroes those who opposed the Pope's will. To those who held the Pope to be God's representative on earth, disobedience was a grave sin. They also blaspheme who say that the Pope cannot err, and that all men should obey him in all things, for he can send whomever he wishes to heaven or hell. For such power belongs to God alone. A cardinal arrived in Prague and performed the ceremony of major excommunication. A bell was rung, a book was closed, and candles were extinguished. The very word itself, uh, out of communion. So you're out of communion with the body. Uh, so you're no longer a member of the body. And to become even more specific and tangible, that means that you cannot receive the sacraments of the body, and especially the Eucharist, which is the sacrament of, a special sacrament of communion. So you are outside. We deprive Jan Hus himself and all his accomplices and all his abettors of the communion of the body of our Lord. We separate him from the society of all Christians. We exclude him from the bosom of our Holy Mother, the Church, in heaven and on earth. We declare him excommunicated and anathematized, and we judge him condemned to eternal fire with Satan and his angels and all the reprobate, so long as he will not burst the fetters of the demon, do penance, and satisfy the Church. In response to the excommunication, he publicly announced that he was going over the Pope's head. He would appeal directly to God. I appeal to God from the grave oppression, the unjust sentence, and the pretended excommunication of the pontiff, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the judges seated in the seat of Moses, to him. I commit my cause, following in the footsteps of our Savior, Jesus Christ. An interdict was pronounced against Hus and anyone who aided him. All religious services were banned in any city Hus visited. There would be no weddings, no funerals, and no mass of any kind as long as Hus remained in Prague. Hus went into voluntary exile. After a period of wandering, he took up residence in a small castle owned by a friend. Hus was not idle during the next two years. His power to draw a crowd was undiminished, and he often gave sermons in open fields, attracting hundreds of attendants. He wrote extensively, formally expressing many of the opinions he had developed over a number of years. Hus argued that the truth was an all-important manifestation of God, that while the totality of the truth was unknowable by mortal man, it was also perfect, holy, and to be respected as one respects God. For in the end, truth prevails. Truth is both a philosophical and theological concept. From the theological perspective, which is the only one that mattered to Hus, truth is with God and as such impossible to discover, since God is imperceptible. There is also truth as a practical and social concept, the way the public understands truth and responds to things on the national level. Hus's famous motto claims that a man must never deny his beliefs and must always put up a brave fight against social pressure and dictatorship. The Holy Roman Emperor, or King of the Romans, had at least 
titular authority over many of the other monarchs in Europe. At this time, Sigismund, the king of Hungary, was assuming the role of emperor as well. Sigismund made it his personal quest to end the schism, unify the papacy, and eliminate any allegations of heresy. He decreed that there would be a council held the following year in Constance, Germany. Unlike the Pisa conference, he hoped that this council would have supremacy over all the popes and that its decisions would be final. Sigismund believed that all of Christianity was in danger from the Ottoman Muslims. His goal was to unite the church and eliminate discord. The final authority resided with Emperor Sigismund, for whom the council's success was extremely important. As the council's protector, it was his task to promote and protect Christianity following the end of the schism. A great opportunity to become a prominent protagonist of the history of the 15th century, in which he actually succeeded. Uniting the church would also mean dealing with Hus and his many followers. Sigismund decreed that Hus would appear at the council as well. I humbly beg your majesty that you extend the grace that coming in peace to the general council, that I may profess publicly the faith I hold. The emperor agreed with the requests and promised Hus an opportunity to speak freely and return home safely. Pope John XXIII, clearly the most popular claimant to the papal throne, arrived at Constance to open the proceedings. His entrance was what one might expect of the most powerful leader in the Christian world. Over him they carried a golden canopy. Before them went nine white horses, all covered with red saddlecloths. Eight of them were laden with apparel, and on the ninth was fastened a casket of silver gilt, within which was the true and holy sacrament. And when the Pope and the Cardinal stopped before the gate, a procession of all the clergy went out to meet him. Jan Hus, along with two wagons of supplies, a handful of supporters, and an escort of two knights set off on the 250-mile journey to Constance. Although he had been promised a safe conduct and had received at least verbal assurances, no documents had yet arrived from the emperor. Hus left a will with a close friend and posted public notices on the door of Prague's major churches telling where he was going and why. However, even as the group traveled, Hus continued to preach and to attract followers. And finally we came to Nuremberg, where merchants who had gone before us had announced our coming. The populace were standing in the streets, looking about, asking, which was Jan Hus? The learned men had sent word ahead that we should meet in private, but I said, I preach in public so that anyone who wants to may hear me. And we met with the councilmen and citizens until dark. After more than three weeks of traveling, Hus and his party arrived in Constance at the very southern edge of Germany. He rented a room in this house just inside the city walls and spent his time preparing his case. When he had rested a day or two, Hus read Mass in his bedchamber next to the living room, and many neighbors who came there to hear him say Mass flocked to the place. A few weeks later, Hus was invited to the Pope's palace to discuss his writings with the bishops and cardinals. This was not to be the hearing he had been promised, just a casual discussion. Despite assurances from both Pope John and the Emperor, Hus's friends suspected it was a trap and advised him not to go. At the request of the Lord Cardinals, I am ready to come to them at once. And if I shall be questioned about any matter, I hope that I would rather choose death than deny any truth that I have learned through the scriptures or otherwise. Jan Hus, the Wycliffeite, who had been teaching the wicked doctrine of Wycliffe in his lodging house at Constance to all who came to meet him there, 
and, who in spite of warning had refused to desist, was taken into custody to prevent his further teaching of that doctrine. This was done by order of our Lord Pope. He was taken to the Dominican monastery and was thrust into a murky and dark dungeon in the immediate vicinity of a latrine. The court in Constance accused Hus primarily of spreading and supporting the teaching of John Wycliffe. He had a difficult time proving that this was not so, and the entire case actually revolved around Wycliffe. Pope John XXIII appointed a panel of 12 scholars to examine Hus. They met with him in this hall at the monastery where Hus was being held. If Hus could be established as having preached the condemned doctrines of Wycliffe, his conviction would be a simple matter. The judges presented 45 articles extracted from the writings of Wycliffe and asked Hus to explain and defend them. Hus replied that he came to the council to discuss his own views, not those of Wycliffe. He was then returned to his basement cell. When he had lain in that prison for several weeks, he fell ill of fever and constipation of the bowels so that his life was despaired of. After six weeks of devastating illness, Hus was moved from a basement cell to this tower. Conditions were still harsh, but his health improved slowly. Then, after Master Jan had recovered somewhat from his illness, the commissioners delivered to him soon afterward about 44 articles which they said had been drawn from his book on the church. Hus composed detailed responses to each of the articles and spent the remaining time writing letters. The months passed slowly for Hus in the tower as the council concerned itself with the matter of the papal schism. After intense pressure, Pope John XXIII solemnly promised to abdicate his throne so long as the other two claimants did the same. The suspicion spread that the Pope and his prelates might leave the council. Accordingly, the King of the Romans had guards posted at the gates and on the lake, and at nighttime in the city as well as on the walls. During a break in the proceedings, Frederick IV, Duke of Austria, arranged a tournament for the entertainment of the visitors. While crowds gathered to watch the spectacle of competing knights, Pope John XXIII, dressed as a common laborer, slipped out of town. Frederick immediately offered protection to Pope John, who summoned church officials loyal to him to follow. The king called on all the princes, lords, counts, nobles, knights, and squires, and cities of the Roman Empire, all his servants, and all who held fiefs to him to proceed against Duke Frederick and his cities. So all joined in the attack upon Duke Frederick, and everyone made ready to take the field with food, guns, powder, and other implements of war, and went out to war with all their might. When Pope John the Twenty-Third left the council, his supporters threatened to follow suit, which would have meant the virtual dissolution of the council. Both the hopes for the unification of the church and the political effect hoped for by Sigismund would have been lost. Therefore, Sigismund sacrificed Hus to the cardinals to give them something to do. Hus, escorted by 170 guards, was moved to the tower at Gottlieben Castle, a few miles outside of Constance. Here he was chained to the wall in the hopes that increased pressure might lead him to recant. They tried to avert Hus's opinions by means common in today's politics. Give and take, confess to something and will not burn you. At that moment, Hus had proven his historical qualities by claiming, if I'm wrong, prove it. This fight for the truth is always complicated, let alone in religious issues. I would not dare submit to the council under the proposed terms, because it would mean either I would have to condemn many truths that they call scandalous, or I would have to commit perjury if I recanted and confessed that I had held those positions. 
I would therefore scandalize a great many of God's people who have heard me preach to the contrary. In the meantime, the council had other matters to contend with. Pope John XXIII had been captured and was returned to Constance in chains. Uh, at his trial, the charges against him were so heinous that a whole lot of them had to be suppressed from public reading. They go to issues of personal integrity, mora morality, uh, and a variety of other less than savory issues about the man. The same Lord Pope John was and is a notorious simoniac and an evil administrator and dispenser of the spiritual and temporal treasures of the church. By his detestable and dishonorable life and character, he has notoriously scandalized the church of God and the Christian people. The said Holy Synod hereby unseats, removes, and deposes him, declaring all and every Christian of whatever rank dignity or condition released from obedience, fealty, and obligation to him. Pope John was stripped of power and was ruled to have never been the legitimate pope. When Angelo Roncalli was elected pope in 1958, he also became known as Pope John XXIII. The former pope reluctantly accepted his fate and was incarcerated in the tower at Gottlieben Castle. The man Hus was on trial for defying was now imprisoned only a few feet away from him. A few days later, the commission gathered to formally consider the case of Jan Hus. Hus was returned to Constance and locked in a cell at the Franciscan Monastery, now an elementary school. Although Hus had spent a great deal of time preparing his presentation for the hearing, he did not present. Instead, he was allowed to respond to the testimony previously given by other witnesses. When Hus wished to respond to them at once, many with one voice clamored simultaneously. And when he wished to explain the ambiguities that those who had excerpted them had repeatedly twisted them into a sense foreign to him, immediately they shouted, Leave off your sophistry and answer yes or no. He then, seeing that to respond to the objections was of no avail, kept still. Whereupon at once others exclaimed, saying, Look, since you are silent, it is a sign that you consent to these errors. By modern standards, the trial that Hus was subjected to in 1415 could not possibly be regarded as fair. Hus was simply obliged to agree with the decisions that the judges handed down. He was obliged to accept their instructions or die. While Hus had challenged the authority of a pope he considered immoral and had opposed policies he felt were wrong, he still clung to the mother church. He believed his positions were consistent with church teachings and that it was the administrators themselves who were in error. Church law stated that a recanted heretic could not be executed, but to Hus, recanting a position he had never held was to be unfaithful to the truth. Be sure that if I knew that I had written or preached anything erroneous or against the law or against the Holy Mother Church, I would desire humbly to recant it. For God is my witness. I have ever desired to be shown better and more relevant scripture than those that I have written or taught. Huss was again promised that he would be given a chance to present his case and was led in chains back to his cell. The hearing never came. Instead, the charges, now reduced to 30, were delivered to him in writing. He was instructed to respond in writing to each charge. Again, church leaders and old friends met privately with Huss in hopes of getting him to renounce the positions in the 30 Articles. Huss held to his beliefs and continued to demand an open hearing. The council ordered all of Huss's work to be burned. 
Hus was offered a final compromise by which he could recant from opposition to church teaching and save his life. It now remains either to recant and abjure and undergo an appalling sentence or that I be burned. Master Jan Hus was led by the Archbishop of Riga to the Cathedral of the City of Constance, where the general session of prelates was held, presided over by the King of the Romans and of Hungary, wearing his crown. Following a sermon, the charges against Hus were read aloud. When Hus offered his responses, he was told to wait and answer all of the charges together. Thereupon, the lectors read that Master Jan Hus had appealed directly to God and condemned such an appeal as an error. To that, Master Jan replied, O oh Lord God, when you were gravely oppressed, you did commit your cause to God, your heavenly Father, the most just judge. Thus you have given us wretches an example that in all grave cases we should appeal to you. This holy synod therefore pronounces the said Jan Hus on account of the aforesaid and many other matters to have been a heretic, and it judges him to be considered and condemned as a heretic, and it hereby condemns him. Hus was then publicly degraded in the cathedral. That is, he was made to stand on a table in priestly robes. One by one the articles he wore were removed and cursed. His priestly tonsure was cut away, and a paper hat was placed on his head. On the hat were pictures of demons and the Latin words, This is a prince of heretics. They led him out of Constance with more than a thousand armed men, and the princes and lords were also armed. Indeed, almost all the inhabitants of that city bearing arms accompanied him to his death. And having come to the place of execution, he, bending his knees and stretching his hands and turning his eyes toward heaven, most devoutly sang psalms. Soldiers led Hus across an empty field where he was chained to a post. Wood was piled around him up to his neck, and pitch was poured over the wood. When the executioners at once lit the fire, the master immediately began to sing in a loud voice. At first, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy upon us. And when he began to sing the third time, the wind blew the flame into his face, and thus praying within himself and moving his lips and the head, he expired in the Lord. Although Hus had always opposed the veneration of relics, the council took no chances. Hus's belongings were burned with him, and all the ashes were dumped into the Rhine River and washed away. Soon, a single pope was selected. The schism had been healed, dissenters had been suppressed, and the work of the council came to an end. But the problems of the church were not over. Back in Prague, thousands of followers of Hus rejected the council's actions and proclaimed Hus a martyr. The revolution the church had feared broke out with a degree of violence beyond their greatest fears. In Bohemia, the Catholic church was brutally repressed. Thousands of faithful Catholics were burned at the stake. We are far from judging Hus today. We try to understand him, to love him. However, we cannot but be aware of the huge problems that his actions have caused. The collapse of a whole national church is no small matter. The entire Catholic structure disappeared. More reformers followed Hus, and while the Catholic Church subsequently reformed itself many times, it never again enjoyed the supremacy it had once held. When the doors to the Dachau concentration camp opened in April 1945, among the survivors was Josef Baron, a Bohemian Catholic priest who had dared to speak out against the abuses of the Nazi occupiers. 
Barron continued to call for individual rights and religious freedom and was soon imprisoned again by the communist government of Czechoslovakia. Twenty years later, the Roman Catholic Church was in the final months of another council. Barron, by then a cardinal and the Archbishop of Prague, addressed the other cardinals. Everywhere and always, the violation of liberty of conscience gives birth to hypocrisy in many people. In my country, the Catholic Church at this time seems to be suffering expiation for defects and sins committed in times gone by in her name against religious liberty, such as in the 15th century with the burning of the priest Jan Hus. In such acts, the secular arm, wishing or pretending to serve the Catholic Church, in reality left a hidden wound in the heart of the people. This trauma was an obstacle to religious progress and offered and offers still facile material to the enemies of the Church. Barron's speech drew a standing ovation and led directly to the adoption of Dignitatis Humanae a doctrine which declares that all people have an inherent right to pursue their own beliefs. It is in accordance with their dignity as persons, that is, beings endowed with reason and free will and therefore privileged to bear personal responsibility, that all men should be at once impelled by nature and also bound by a moral obligation to seek the truth, especially religious truth. They are also bound to adhere to the truth once it is known, and to order their whole lives in accord with the demands of truth. However, men cannot discharge these obligations in a manner keeping with their own nature, unless they enjoy immunity from external coercion, as well as psychological freedom. The Catholic Church promised to defend religious freedom in every context, but Barron went further suggesting the church should apologize for the death of Hus. When Barron died in 1969, there had been no progress toward this goal. In 1993, Miloslav Luck, Barron's successor as Cardinal and Archbishop of Prague, was instructed by Pope John Paul II to investigate the causes and impact of the death of Jan Hus. Much of the research was directed by Dr. Frantisek Holček, a monk with the Order of St. Francis of Paula. We have tried to discover the truth behind the events, the backgrounds of Hus's deeds, his testimony, the model of the church that he wishes to establish, and the area of conflict between his thoughts and the official church doctrine presented at the Council of Constance. For almost eight years, members of the Commission studied documents and reviewed all the factors that had led to the death of Jan Hus. His writings, his opponents, and the nature of his work were thoroughly explored. Hus was finally receiving the open hearing he had been promised. While there were disagreements over the validity of some of Hus's teachings, no one denied that he was a sincere man whose only crime was seeking the will of God. He was a man who loved Jesus Christ with all of his heart and believed that the solution to the great crisis of the Western Church was the return to the Paulian model of Church as the mystical body of Christ. The Commission submitted its findings to the Vatican and waited for a response. In 1999, the results of the research were presented at a formal symposium in Rome. Pope John Paul II addressed the assembled scholars directly. Today, on the eve of the great jubilee, I feel the need to express deep regret for the cruel death inflicted on Jan Hus. The wounds of past centuries must be healed through a new attitude and completely renewed relationships. Faith has nothing to fear from the work of historical research, for in the final analysis, research too 
is directed toward the truth, which has in God its source. The truth can also prove uncomfortable when it asks us to abandon long-held prejudices and stereotypes. Yet the truth which sets us free from error is also the truth which sets us free for love. It had been almost 600 years, but perhaps the words of Jan Hus had finally borne out. Truth prevails. <laughs>